All right, welcome everybody to our October BT List Live webinar. I'm Drew Most. I'm a translation consultant working in Central Africa with uh, SIL. And I am delighted to have with us today, Dr. Samek Hanna as our special guest. Welcome, Samek. Thank you. Um, today, we're going to be exploring paratextuality and the Arabic Bible. I'm delighted that everybody can be here. Just a reminder, um, this is a webinar, so you will not necessarily be able to turn on your audio or video unless we permit you to do so. So do not sweat it if you're unable to activate your mic or your video. Um, just sit back and relax and enjoy the show. I want to go ahead and introduce our uh, main guest today. Um, Dr. Hanna completed his undergraduate studies in English literature and linguistics, as well as an MA in literary theory at Ain Shams University in Egypt in 2000. He then moved to the University of Manchester, where he completed his PhD in translation and intercultural studies, with a dissertation on the Arabic translation, translations of Shakespeare's tragedies from a sociological perspective in 2006. Immediately afterwards, he joined uh, University College London as an Andrew Mellon postdoctoral fellow in the humanities, where he contributed to teaching translation studies and literary translation. He also pursued research into the so sociology of drama translation and the social history of literary translation in late 19th and early 20th centuries Egypt. After holding a lectureship in Arabic and translation studies at the University of Salford, he joined Leeds University in 2013, where he was Associate Professor of Arabic Literature and Translation and Director of Arabic, Islamic, and Middle Eastern Studies before joining the United Bible Societies in 2019. Now, I see that this bio, Samek, is already out of date because did I just see that you've... Um, You've accepted a position as associate editor of the journal Target, the translation studies. That's right. Journal. It just happened a few a few days ago. Actually, it was announced uh, only two days ago, actually. And wow. um, this role is to start um, this coming January. That that is wonderful. Congratulations. Thank that you. is that's absolutely absolutely phenomenal. Well, to jump right in here, Samek, I, I've got a number of copies of what I would consider sacred scripture. I've got this one. It, it looks kind of plain. This one it has a bit more decoration. It's blue. I kind of like that. Um, and then I've got this one, a bit more adorned. And even looking inside, it contains lovely notes uh, that I find really helpful. This one, to me, stands out quite a bit. It's got this interesting border around it. Um, Surprisingly, one of the ones that's the least adorned is this critical text of the Greek New Testament. Uh, moving on here, I've got another French one, kind of like this. This one looks like the others, but when I turn inside, I notice that the title of the book has a border around it. Mm -hmm. This one's just black. This one's gold. This one again, kind of plain looking. And then I have one like this that opens the other way than I'm used to. But look how beautifully adorned, it's green. So we've got a variety of colors. We've got a variety of ways of presenting sacred scripture. Now in my naive Western eyes, I might just think that all of this is due to marketing that people are just trying to sell Bibles, so we're packaging it in a variety of ways, just simply due to marketing. But from a sociological perspective, what, what do you see is going on here? Well, ma marketing is definitely part of it, but as you have said, it's only just one minor part of it. If you are to look at that sociologically and put it in a sociocultural context, the things that we use to take for granted, like the front cover, black cover, blurbs, the borders inside and out, these things tell us an awful lot of information about who produced the translation, for whom. Uh, these paratextual features, and that's the term we're going to talk about now, they tell us an awful lot about the translation strategy. They tell us 
about the kind of audience, the specific constituency of readership that these producers of the translation are targeting. And these are very, very complex things. I mean, the network between the producer and the consumer of the translation, um, you can find something about the patrons, the sponsors, uh, those who commission the translation and caused it to happen. Uh, so sociologically, you can, you can have a few gleanings about the social network which made that translation available and possible. But in Bible translation, um, one might say that we are simply interested in the original text, that all we care about is the text that's in the lines, and that is the pinnacle of biblical studies, as one scholar has called it. The pinnacle of biblical studies is the disembodied biblical text. But I'm seeing here that, um, is it the case that paratext has a role to play in interpretation? Absolutely, it does have a role to play from the point of view of the producers of the translation. And this is something that we have covered just now. We'll say a few more about that later. But of course, from the point of view of the receiver, the paratext, the cover, and all of the other elements that we have just mentioned, they help the receiver or the reader to structure the process of, the process of reading itself. They point me in a specific path, specific ways of reading it. Um, so we'll see later, there are differences between the way, for example, the RSV is framed by paratext and the way GNB is framed. And these different ways tell us something about the process of reception. How do these translators, the producers of this translation, how do they conceive their own readers and the process of reception itself? How do they, how do they structure it? Mm. I see, okay. So exploring a bit more this uh, sociological approach to translation. Who are some of the key players? If we want to understand this approach, certainly you yourself are a key player in the dialogue in, in, um, in this uh, subdomain of translation studies, but who are some other seminal, uh, what are some seminal works and some key players? Right, so when we talk about the sociological approach to translation, first of all, we need to use that in the plural. We're not only um, the last, the last few years, at least the last, the last decade, witnessed um, a, a mushrooming of different sociological approaches in the plural. Uh, of course, they do have things in common, but there are differences, uh, and the differences have to do with the, 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 the various perspectives through which they see translation as a socially situated phenomenon. Um, so if we are to talk about the key names, um, one name that has exercised a lot of influence in the sociology of translation since the 1990s, despite the fact that he himself has not written on translation, apart from just one article he wrote towards the end of his life and that the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, um, and he wasn't interested at all in translation, only one article he wrote towards the end where he talked about intercultural relationships, including translation, but mostly he was very, very interested in um, cultural production. How do we produce culture, including literature, plastic arts, and things like that. But the corpus of work he produced, he has been producing since 1970s actually, uh, had a lot of influence on a number of translation study scholars. And we started to see this influence um, from the mid 1990s. Uh, and it all started by a number of individual articles, then special issues of journals, like the translator, um, and then whole volumes. Um, so we have Pierre Bourdieu, the influence that Pierre Bourdieu appeared in the work of people like uh, Inglery, people like uh, Bachelor, uh, people like Michaela Wolf, all of these are names from within translation studies. If I am to mention another name in the area of sociology, you had a similar influence, probably less influence, but similar. In translation studies, uh, I'll mention the name of Bruno Latour, and his theory is known by uh, the Actor Network. Um, again, is very much interested in social networking and how things get done through these networks. But um, if, if I am to add one thing just to simplify without being simplistic, um, all of these approaches, what they have in common, uh, and this is something that can help us see translation from a different perspective. And let me try to, to explain it in these terms. Um, 
all these approaches, they help us to see social phenomena, including translation. And now we're going to, to say a few words about how we can look at translation as a socially situated, socially conditioned phenomenon. All these approaches have in common this idea. When we try to interpret and explain social phenomena, we need to avoid this simplistic way of thinking that these, these phenomena have been conditioned and, and made possible by one cause, what sociologists call the unicausality. Um, but if you want to really understand them and appreciate their complexity and richness, you need to look at multi-causality. And this is what we have in these approaches. And this is something that we can easily apply to translation. So when we look to translation, as you have just mentioned, some people still think that any translation is made possible only because of the existence of a source text, which is partly true. Source texts are important. Uh, without them, uh, all of what we're, we are doing would not have been possible. But there are many other intricate and complicated factors uh, that play an equally important role with the source text that make our work uh, possible and available. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Okay, so now kind of heading into these key concepts, I, I'm trying to remember a little bit, uh, when we talk about paratext, um, the Oxford English Dictionary, for example, says that we're talking about the textual and visual material that surrounds or supplements the main body of a published work, both as part of its physical format and outside of this, and then seeing this material together as a frame which contextualizes a text and informs its interpretation. But I hear you speaking more in terms of agency, that there are agents who are involved. Um, and I'm also thinking as well, is it Bourdieu who has this uh, formula? What are some of the key concepts that we inherit from Bourdieu to, um, to, to look at translation through a sociocultural perspective? I'm thinking of terms that I've come across like habitus and field and all these things that I don't quite understand. Can you give us, can you help put those cookies on the bottom shelf? How do we digest this? Yes. Um, the great challenge here is that I, I'm trying to share these things without complicating the picture, but at the same time, I'm trying to avoid simply simplifying it to the extent of making it um, uh, less clearer than it should be. Uh, one key term, as you have mentioned, that, that Bourdieu developed and it has been quite influential is the concept of field. And basically, he says here, if you want to make sense, if you want to decode any social phenomenon, you need to locate it in a field. Um, and the field is much more intricate than the, the, the concept of context. We know from Marxism, Marxist criticism has introduced, introduced this idea of that context, the social context. And for somebody like Bourdieu, the context is kind of static. But the idea of the field is very much dynamic because you can see change, you can see motion, you can, you can see social relationships in action. Field is, is just like a playing field, players um, who are on the pitch, um, they are competing over scoring goals and, and winning. Uh, so they are fighting over what he calls capital. Do you want to achieve some capital? Do you want to win in the field? Um, and they have specific skills, they have specific uh, uh, capital as well through which they can perform their own role. But in addition to the skills, they have something what you call the habitus. And the habitus, by that he means um, not only the skills, but um, the training these, these players have received, their own worldview, their own professionalization, the way they do things, um, they, the, the way they react to their own members of the same team and to others in the opposite team. This is what he calls habitus, behaving in a field in a spontaneous way without thinking about it. It's, it's part of you. And mm. by using this term, would you help us to overcome this dichotomy of subject and object? What mm. is subjective and what is objective? So in habitus, you try to be yourself, you play in the field, you try to be a part of the team, but at the same time, you are not totally free because what you have been trained to do is part of the overall context. It comes from the rules of the game. Uh, everybody knows these rules. 
So you are not totally free to do whatever you do. You, you can only perform your role within the square. There are things you know that if you do, you will be penalized. Um, so that notion of, of, of habitus helps us to understand that we are not totally subjective, but at the same time, we are not totally objective. Um, if I am to use this term, we are intersubjective, something in the middle between total subjectivity and total objectivity. I don't know if this makes sense. Well, no, um, the goal here is just to kind of give us an introduction to some of the key concepts, and then hopefully through the show notes, we'll provide reading material that we can just continue the conversation either as a BT community or within the wider translation studies community. No, so thank you for helping introduce us to those concepts. So I'm just wondering how well have we done in the past at looking at translation through a sociological approach? Or said another way, what are, given a sociological approach to translation, what would you see as an idea in translation studies that you would prefer it simply went away? If you had your choice. An idea to go away, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yes, right, yes. G given all of what we have said now, one idea, I don't want to, I don't want it to go completely away, but I want us to think about it critically. The whole idea of fidelity and faithfulness, which mm. always comes up when we start talking about translation, whether in the context of the Bible or in other contexts, um, because given what I've said, the source text is there, it does play a role in shaping the translation, but there are some other factors. Um, and that's why we need to pro problematize the notion of fidelity and faithfulness. To whom are we going to be faithful? What kind of party? What do we mean by faithfulness? The definition of faithfulness itself differs across time and across cultural boundaries. What you see as faithfulness, I might disagree with you in my own cultural context. And another person, another translator from 100 years ago might, might even see it quite differently. So we do need to problematize that. I don't want it to go completely away, let it, let's not keep it there, but we want to, to think about it from different perspectives. Hmm, okay, excellent. Um, so who from antiquity would you most like to sit down with for a chat? Yes, I've thought about that. Yes, th th there are many people and it's quite hard to prioritize. Uh, if I am to choose one, I, I think I will go for Schleiermacher, the well-known German theologian and uh, translator himself and intellectual. And my chat will be um, mainly focused on um, a series of lectures he gave in 1813 and then he published that later in 1815 called On Different Methods of Translating. Hmm. And the argument he, he, he simply developed in, um, in these lectures, it's the same idea that we, until now, after Schleiermacher, after more than how many years now, we keep going back to it in simple forms. It's a fascinating idea, but at the same time, it tends to be a little bit simplistic if we're not cautious enough how to approach it and how to describe it. So in this, in this, um, in this publication, he simply said this idea. Now we have the author and we have the reader, and simply we have two methods of translating based on our orientation to the author or to the reader. Mm -hmm. So you either leave the author in peace and try to move the reader towards him, or you leave the reader in peace and push the author towards him. That's, that's interesting, that's, that's intelligent. What I don't really like about this statement, which has, which has been incarnated in the field of uh, translation studies in different forms. So uh, the two concepts of foreignization versus domestication by Venuti. Overt and covert translation, Juliana House. All of these concepts come from Schleiermacher. Uh, mm -hmm. What I really don't like about this statement is the either or, because in the reality, Translation cannot be seen in these dichotomous terms. It's not mm. an either or. In every act of translation, you have a bit of the author and you have a bit of the reader. Uh, mm. and, and, and these proportions are different from one case to the other, from one age to the other, but both of them have some relevance. So it's completely, it's almost impossible to make um, an a priori decision and say that, well, I'm going to produce a translation that is totally 
uh, oriented towards the other. This is not uh, this is not mm. real. This is not practical. Okay. Well, if I had a choice between either or, either me continuing to interview you or allowing <laughs> you to give us a presentation on the Arabic Bible, I would definitely choose the latter. So why don't you go ahead and take it away? Talk to us about the interaction of paratext and the Arabic Bible, please. Okay, thank you so much, Drew. Uh, let me try to share my screen and uh, hopefully technology works. Um, and you tell me if you can see my slides. Yeah, yeah. So let's start from the very beginning, theorizing the concept. It all started with the work of um, a, French, a French literary scholar by the name of Gérard Ginet, who was interested in the study of narrative, rhetoric, um, and the reception of literature, generally speaking. He came out with a number of publications since 1980s. A number of these publications made their way into the English-speaking world. Uh, one of them is, is, is very influential, has proved to be very influential, and that's his paratexts. Um, and of course, that work uh, gave us the definition, the foundational definition and typology of paratexts, what they are, how they function, how can we understand them? And then uh, um, after that, his, his ideas made their way to translation studies, first of all, in the form of chapters in edited volumes, articles, until a couple of years ago, 2018, we had a full length publication, full book uh, by Catherine Batchelor, trying to look at Jeanette's work in the context of translation. Mind you, Jeanette himself did not talk much about translation. Um, and his focus was on literature and that's why his ideas were, were useful, but at the same time, they are, they are problematic when we think about other types of translation like sign language interpreting of the Bible, like audiovisual translation. How can his ideas, which were mainly focused on the script, on the written text, how can they help us? So we still need a lot of theorizing and research to try to apply his work uh, to different types of translation. Uh, the very notion of paratext entered the area of Bible translation. It's not new, but it was used um, through different other terms. Uh, so neither, for example, used the concept of supplementary helps. Uh, Catherine uh, Bond will use the uh, supplementary material. So the idea, the notion was there, but um, the concept was what was used quite lately. This is just one example, and I think it is in the reading list. Um, that's an MA dissertation by Kluckenberg. I hope he's listening to us, he's here with us. That's a fantastic work, uh, a very interesting piece of research which tries to unpack the concept of paratext in the context of Bible translation with very, very interesting results. The, the case studies provided towards the very end um, translations of the Bible in, uh, in Benin, in Africa, um, absolutely fascinating. So that's in a snapshot how the concept traveled from literature into translation studies into Bible translation. Going quickly, in order to understand paratextuality, we need to put it in the context of the work of Jeanette. Jeanette was very much interested in what he called transtextuality. Whatever lies beyond the text, but still affects its reception and its interpretation. So textual transcendence or uh, transtextuality for him is everything that brings the text into a relation with other texts. Uh, and we have a, a number of transtextual phenomena. Paratextuality is only one of them. And by the way, all of, these, all of these elements, they can be of interest for us in Bible translation. So for example, intertextuality, it's about the relationship between, between one text and another. We can see that quite clearly in uh, quotations from the Old Testament in the New Testament. That's another whole area of research. How are these intertextual allusions and citations uh, interpreted and translated? Metatextuality, one text commenting on another without having to quote from it. Sometimes there are quotations and citations, but it's all about commenting and exegeting and explaining. Example, commentaries, translating commentaries. Um, and then we have what, what he called hypertextuality. 
And that's not only about quoting a line or a couple of lines, it's about uh, a new text grafting itself on an older text. A new text taking its life from an older one and trying to rework the older texts. The clear example that comes to mind is the writings of Francine Rivers, for example, Redeeming Love. That's the whole, a whole piece of fiction which is grafted on the book of Hosea. You cannot make sense of this novel, uh, let alone you cannot, you cannot translate it into any other language without understanding the text that lies behind it, the text on which uh, this novel is grafted. And then the whole notion of architectuality, the relationship between a text and a whole collection of texts that we call a genre. Uh, so uh, the relationship between any one single psalm and uh, the mode of writing we call psalms, how the psalms are written, and so on and so forth. And paratextuality is only one of these transtextual elements. So what is it very simply? That's a very straightforward definition. A liminal framing device or a convention both within the book, we can see it physically with the book, and it can lie outside the book. And there are two terms that uh, Jeanette uses here, uh, the peritext or the physically attached elements with the book and the epitext, those elements which lie outside the book, like promotional material, like reviews uh, and things like that. What are the functions of paratext? One thing that the paratext uh, frames um, do is tell us that this piece of writing is in its end product and it is available for reception and reading. And that's the difference between a draft piece of writing and the final, uh, the final product of, um, of any text in the form of a book with a cover, with a title, introduction, things like that. So all of these paratextual frames, they tell us that this is the end product. Same notion we can apply to audiovisual translation, for example. If you look at some shots from uh, uh, rehearsals of the passion, uh, these, these shots from the rehearsals, I would describe them as drafts. Uh, but when I see a poster of the passion outside the movie theater, when I see the intro credits and the closing credits, these are all paratextual frames that tell me this is the final product that is worth looking at. Uh, of course, if you are interested, if you want to know something about what was happening behind the scenes, you can see the rehearsals. But if you want to receive um, that film in its final product, this is where you need to go. Now, this links up with what Drew asked me about um, the sociological function of paratext. It's not only about helping them, they help us to um, structure our reception. They set certain expectations before we open the book and, and engage with the text. But at the same time, they set the whole book or the whole translation in a context, in a pragmatic context. They tell us something about uh, the producers who are the authors or the translators. Um, covers and prefaces and footnotes tell us something about the genre of that book about um, the patrons or the funders, um, about the gatekeepers, who are those persons who made this translation available for us, and so on and so forth. So these elements are really important to put uh, any given text, any given translation in a sociological context. It's not only about the source text, it's about many other uh, parties, uh, many other human agents, many other institutions, uh, that we need to be aware of before we appreciate the complexity of uh, that book or this translation. One metaphor that Jeanette uses to talk about paratext and how it functions is the, the metaphor of the threshold. Um, and the threshold is a boundary between any given house and the outside world. So before you go into any other house, you need to step that, uh, that threshold. Um, 
you can you can see something of that house you can you cannot see all of it but that threshold sets some expectations it gives you a peek through that house it tells you something about that house that might either invite you to go in or turn you away and this is exactly how paratexts work um, and that's why any producers of a book publishers when i say producers i'm, I'm talking about different agents it's not only about the author it's about the author the publisher the uh, the, the designer of the front cover all of these are the producers the way they design the paratext um, through this way they they have in mind a specific constituency of readers they want to invite a specific sector of readers and they are not interested in other sectors and this is what exactly uh, the threshold does inviting and turning away filtering through specific audiences and this is what what bachelor tells us in her book um, paratext is all about structuring the process of reception telling telling us how to go about that text what to read uh, what areas we need to focus on and so on and so forth one important dimension about para paratext is that they are changing they are various and there are factors which make them changeable so paratext change over time um, the way uh, people used um, to provide illustrations with manuscripts that was used as a paratext the way we provide illustrations in our books with our body translation they function differently um, other elements as well, uh, prefaces, footnotes, they function differently, not only from one time to another, but from one culture to another. And that's important. That's just one example. That's, that's a footnote from, an, from the ESV study Bible. And just try to imagine if a group of translators trying to produce study Bible in any given language other than English, and they are using the ESV as, as the model text. And they come across a footnote like this one, a footnote trying to explain uh, um, these 11 verses in John 8 about the story of the woman caught in adultery. And you have something like that saying that this story does not exist in the oldest manuscripts. Perhaps that goes fine. That is that is absolutely acceptable in the English-speaking culture, the culture of producing study Bibles in English. That's acceptable. That's fine. But if you translate that literally, if you translate that paratext literally into another language where this whole idea about the text and how it developed might not be acceptable, that might cause problems. And that tells us about the difference in function of paratext from one culture to another. That's one other example. This is the front cover of the first edition of King James. And innocently, if you don't even know that this is King James, you can tell from the front cover that that's a very archaic translation. That's an old one. Uh, th th this kind of covers might not be uh, produced nowadays. Differences from one edition to the other, the use of illustrations, just very nice examples, the, the illustrations provided with the GNB. Uh, very nice illustrations. I do remember them. They were used in some Arabic versions of the Bible that I used them years ago. Uh, the nice, uh, the nice drawings uh, by Annie uh, Velutun. And you can see the focus in these, in these drawings. The focus in these il illustrations are not on the detailed representation of the human beings. Um, of that historical um, culture of the Bible, it's the focus is on simply on the on the attitude, on the um, motion, on the dynamics of the biblical situation. It's not meant to represent fully every single detail of these biblical figures and what they did. These illustrations are only meant to give you an overall idea about the dynamics of the situation. That's typically different from. The illustrations done by some other illustrator, Horace Nolan's illustrations done for the RSV. And you, ca you can see the differences here. Illustrations here are detailed representation of the culture of the Bible and its figures. 
And you can even see maps. So the translation intends to give you the impression that that's a very close representation of the biblical text and its culture. So you can see here that the paratext function in conjunction with the actual text, they serve the same scopus, they serve the same function. Right. Um, how much time do I have to talk about the Arabic Bible? I'll try to skip um, some slides because we have obviously wasted some time uh, through. Um, Go ahead. You, we've got about uh, 20 minutes for you to continue your presentation, but I don't think anybody's going to riot if you go over. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Um, just a few words about that complex history. And that, again, this is part of my objective from, from this presentation. If you, um, you can only go away with that notion of the importance of the context, the context where we translate is important, is fundamental for the success of our work. If I manage to persuade you with that, that would be a success. And the use of the case of the Arabic translations are just meant to serve that purpose. That's a very complicated context. And that context kept developing since uh, mid eighth century, at least as far as we know, the earliest translation of any biblical text is a, a fragment uh, of Psalm 77 that goes back to uh, mid eighth century. After that, we have different um, eras and different ways and different strategies of translating. So it's quite hard to put all of these, um, all of this time since um, mid 8th century until now, it's very hard to put all of these translations in one basket. We have a lot of variety uh, and this lot of variety have to do with the producers of the translation. It has to do with the uh, targeted audience. We have different audiences. But it also has to do with the historical context. Uh, we all know that um, but, but by the beginning, by the late seventh century, beginning of eighth century, most of the area we know as North Africa, the Levant, Palestine, Jordan, Lebanon, as we know them nowadays, um, all of these areas have been Arabicized or Islamicized. Um, so at some point, the Christians living in these areas together with some other Christians living in the Arab Peninsula. Until the coming of Islam, they were talking either Coptic, North Africa, especially Egypt, um, Greek, um, Levant, Palestine, Jordan, and all of this area, um, or Syriac around Iraq and some pockets in the Arab Peninsula. But when, when the uh, Arabicization policy um, has dominated uh, because of obvious reasons. Um, the Christians at that time found themselves in the position of having to maintain their own Christian faith, um, to keep it for their own um, kids and, and, and sons and daughters in their, own, in their own communities, and also to be able to, to share their own faith with others. And these two elements, keeping the faith and maintaining it and being able to share it, these two historical factors, they have conditioned and shaped some of uh, the cases we're going to see now. Uh, so I'll skip this one, um, but just, just something to, to, to mention here, um, the whole area, the whole discipline of the Arabic Bible is quite a recent discipline. Of course, there have been some scholarship in the form of articles, uh, uh, little treatises about the history of the Arabic Bible, but in terms of having a discipline with its own conceptual tools and methodologies, we're talking about the last, the last 10 years. Uh, and what you can see in this slide is just a few examples, a few instances of publications. Uh, the one book um, that, 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 that fully tried to, to survey Historically, what has been happening since mid 8th century is Sidney Griffiths, of course, the Bible in Arabic. Um, after that, a few other publications came out, mainly because of interest, not only by individuals, but by groups of researchers and departments, uh, whether in Israel, in Europe. Uh, one particular project that I would like to draw your attention to is Biblia Arabica. Uh, 
and that's a joint research project between the University of Tel Aviv and the University of Munich in, German, in Germany. And the interest of this group of researchers is to just try to map out that history. The assumption, as I'm going to say later, the assumption is that we have only touched, we have only scratched the surface of this history. There is a lot, hundreds, probably thousands of manuscripts which lay in archives, in, in museums, and nobody has been able to have access to them, study them, and put them in a socio-cultural context. So there is a lot of work to be done. We only know, know a few little um, things about that history. One of the attempts, um, one of the initiatives that has been done from within the Arab world that tries to make researching that context history, that tries to make that accessible and easy is try to digitize at least the Arabic gospels, the different translations of the gospels since late 8th century until 19th century, try to digitize that, them. So that's a very interesting project that uh, if you are interested, try to have a look at the platform of the Arabic versions of the New Testament, Pavun, uh, which is sponsored and managed by the University of Development um, uh, in Beirut. Very, very interesting and very useful. A few con contextual things about, um, about the history of the Arabic body before I share a few cases. As I've said, before Islam, there have been um, uh, Christian tribes, even in the Arab Peninsula, we know them by name, these tribes, the Hassanids and the Lachmids, and so on and so forth. So we know that they have been there. Um, we know the kind of language they have been using, especially the liturgical language. In the case of the Arab Peninsula, they use Syriac, in addition to Arabic, of course. Um, Coptic and Greek were used somewhere else. Um, what we are not quite sure about, and this is an issue which is still uh, debated uh, among researchers, and that's whether or not they had scripted Arabic Bibles before Islam. That's a very important issue which is still subject to debate. So we have one team, one group of researchers saying that, well, there was no Arabic script because there was need and uh, uh, there were some Arabic versions which were communicated through liturgy, through mass services. There was no need for a book that was an oral culture and Christianity was just communicated orally. There might have been a few copies which were kept in churches, but generally speaking, um, the Bible was communicated orally. There are some other scholars who say, who say that, that there must have been some copies before Islam, but the problem is uh, we don't have archeological evidence of these copies. Now, let's share a few things which might help us understand what I have been talking about so far regarding paratextuality, how it helps us to structure our reception, how it helps us to uh, put translation in a context, who is translating for whom, using which language and under what conditions. So that's a translation of a number of Paul's letters that were done as uh, old as uh, 867. Uh, the well-known Sinai Arabic Codex 151, a very important manuscript. And there are a number of um, very interesting things. I wish I have uh, time to talk about this manuscript in one, in one talk. A number of interesting things. One of them has to do with different translation norms, different ways of doing things. And of course, there are different ways of interpreting that. Why is the translator contradicting himself? And by the way, the man is called Bishr ibn al-Sirri, and that translation was done in Damascus. So if you look at the opening of the letter to Romans, to the right-hand side of the screen, you have the typical opening, opening expression, which you find in most of um, Arabic Christian literature. Bismillah wal ibn wal ruh al qudus al ilah al wahid amin. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. But if you look to the uh, left hand side of the screen, and we have here an image of the opening of uh, 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 the first letter to the Corinthians, and the opening is 
is different. That's the well-known um, opening um, expression used in Quranic chapters, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of God, uh, the most compassionate, the most merciful. So as a social historian, I mean, this raises a number of questions. How can you explain that? How can you make sense of that? Of course, there is one easy way of explaining that by saying that probably later one copyist has added uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim later. It was not meant to be in the first copy. That's one way of doing it. That's one way of going about it. Um, but there are other ways of going about it. Um, for me, I would look at that as a moment where I can see a translator not really decided about how to make use of this new language. And remember, that was still a new language that was adopted by the Christians of the time. Um, so still trying to find their feet in that language. How can they communicate their own sacred text using the right words? Um, especially if that translation meant to be shared by others who don't necessarily believe in Christianity. That's another example that goes back to the uh, 14th century. And that's a translation of the Pentateuch. And by the way, um, also, I don't have time to talk about that. Uh, um, the Bible was not um, was not the object of interest by Christians um, living in the Arab world under Islam, but it was also the interest of uh, Arabic speaking Jews. So we had a number of translations done by Arabic speaking Jews. One name that I think all of you know is Saad Yagaoun, um, a well-known rabbi and Jewish philosopher who lived in the 9th and 10th century and uh, did a number of he called Tarjama Tafsiriya uh, exegetical translations. Um, and again, when you look at his translations, you can see some significant influence coming from the sacred text of the other, coming from the Quran and Islamic literature. So this is from the introduction of an Arabic Pentateuch, 1358. And again, you can see clearly the use of these expressions. The Basmala in the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate, it is there. What we call in Arabic the Hamdala, Alhamdulillah, praise be to God. Even the word, and that's peculiar, the word uh, Mus'haf and Mustahif in the Arabic language. In the dictionary, Mus'haf means um, a collected book, it means a book. But after, uh, after the rise of Islam, uh, the word was, was almost used to talk about the Quran. And it seems to me that this translator, I'm not quite sure whether he was a Jew or, or, or a Christian, he used that word to talk about the Pentateuch, al-Masahif. And that's very, very interesting. Does that paratext tell us something about what kind of audience he had in mind? Does that tell us something about the tension between these two languages, between these two belief systems? What does it tell us? Uh, that's a whole, lot of sociological research and social history. Try to move fast now. One other case from the 14th century, that's another interesting one. Uh, and that was uh, uh, the person who did it was a bishop of uh, Assyrian Christians at the time, and he was commissioned. The bishop himself did the translation, and the translation was meant to be a lectionary. And that's very, very important. So far, all of the examples I've shared with you, they do illustrate para text as visual framing elements, elements that speak to the eye of the readers. But in some of these cases, there are some paratextual framing elements which rather speak to the ear. The sound is very important. And remember, this was meant to be read out in churches in liturgies and in masses. Um, I don't have the time to read all of that, but you can see even by the eye, you can see that the last word um, in every single line read from right to left, the last words are quite similar in the last letters. It's the same, so there is a rhyme. And of course, when you read it out, there is a rhythm. Um, and that again comes very close to the, to the texture of the Quran. The, the, the predominance of the sound, the rhyming, 
what we call in Arabic the sarja, uh, the parallel sounds between different verses, we can see that here. What's interesting is that in this translation, um, the translator did not compromise the lexicon. The lexicon is very much theologically sound, but he played with the rhyme and the rhythm. Uh, so paratextually, we can talk about uh, vocal paratext here. Just to give you one example, uh, and I would love to read this out because that's important. Just one example from John chapter one, the first five verses. In the beginning was the word, we all know that. Just two examples from the current authorized version, the Arabic Van Dyke version, which is used by the majority of Arabic speaking Christians and al subawis the one which was done in 1300. Um, I'll, I'll read both, or probably the first one, just for you to recognize the, the vocal paratextual framing elements. How is the sound helpful in structuring the reception process by the readers or the hearers in this case? I'm reading now the old one, the ancient one, 1300. <laughs> وكان الله معل العلل هذا كان في القدم موجودا عند الله ومنتقل كل كونا بيده وهو له فعل ولا شيء من دونه موجود ومفتعل به كانت الحياة لما اعتدل والحياة هي نور الناس لمن عقل وللنور إضاءة في قتام الظلل so it's quite obvious here. The rhythm is obvious and most importantly, the rhyme. So the whole of John 1 is done this way using one simple uh, mono rhyming scheme. You don't have all of that in the 19th century version. And of course that makes you think um, as a scholar, as a translator, why do we have that? Why didn't uh, the bishop in the 1300s simply do it uh, in prose without versifying it? We need to go back and find out about the context. And we need to find out about the influence of the neighboring belief system. And we need to find out about the kind of apologetics that were going on at that time. All of these are issues that help us. It's quite easy to judge. It's very, very simple to say, well, this is not, uh, in line with the source text, going back to that issue. But if you put it in the social context and understand all of the factors which fed into the process, uh, maybe that will help us to appreciate what we see in front of us. That's a case which I really like, because this is one among very few cases which don't tell us about the linguistic character of the translation, but it tells us about the um, overall strategy of the translator. This translator is sharing with us how he perceives the biblical text and how he wants his readers to perceive it. Again, it's, it's written in rhyme and rhythm. I don't have the time to read all of that, but I'll give you a literal gloss of this translation to appreciate what we are talking about here. Um, this is what he says in, in that extract from this preface to this translation of the Gospels. I appeal to the light of your mercy talking to God and take up the interpretation of your holy book, the fountain of life and happiness, translating it from Greek into Arabic and using it to resist the snares of the cursed Satan. Because there is some kind of subtle language we don't know what what he's talking about here by, by saying the stairs, and to use it to remove the rustiness. I like that, these, these coming four lines, and to use it to remove the rustiness of the senses through looking at it, listening to its content, touching it, tasting the sweet fruit of its life giving, teaching and smelling the scent of its joyful literature that dispels unpleasant pain and hurtful obsessions. Well, quite recently, we, we have started talking about uh, translation as an act of incarnation. That, that's an iconic example of what it means to translate um, 
inspired by this fundamental concept in Christianity, incarnation. God and his word being accessible, seen, and touched. When you, when you read that introduction, it, it only reminds me of first letter of John chapter 1. We came close to him. We touched him. We saw him from close. Uh, so this is the way this Christian translator talking about his act of translating. It's all about making the smell, the scent of the word of God uh, accessible. It's all about making my readers touch it. Uh, absolutely wonderful. Um, that's another peculiar case comes from the 13th century and that's a dictionary uh, that was found in uh, Mount Sinai Monastery. And the nice thing about this dictionary is that um, before I, I talk about this case, uh, I just need to mention a few things about the function of a dictionary among Arabic speaking Christians. Uh, of course, it is meant to be read out uh, in church services with the biblical text to be read out in, in services. But when we examine some of these lecture lists, we found, uh, especially when we look towards the ends of these manuscripts, we found that there are some other social functions other than sharing the biblical text. Uh, so when you go towards the end, uh, you can see things like what you have here on this slide, information about members of the community who attend this congregation, who attend these services, uh, information about birth dates and about death, about uh, who did what, who married whom, and what, on what date. So besides the fact that this is a biblical text, it's a social document. You can read a lot into it about the members of the congregation, um, what kind of relationship they had with each other. And of course, the names of the members of the congregation are really interesting. Sometimes they are puzzling for me when I look at these names in old manuscripts. So with this one, for example, uh, let's read the gloss. On the eighth of the great month of Ramadan, and it's quite peculiar for writers of the lectionary for whoever recorded that to use the Islamic calendar. 720, mother of Marzouk and wife to Muhammad, so typical Islamic name, Ibn Sa'id passed away. That's a record of the death date of this person. May God's mercy rest on her and on those who ask for God's mercy to rest on her. So again, that raises a number of questions um, about who, who had access to these congregation services, about who had access to these biblical translations, were the only read and, and, and heard by Christians or probably Muslims, heard them, uh, are these persons converts or what? These are all very complicated social as well as historical questions that makes you think when you see this stuff. Um, I don't have much time, I'll just say a few words about 1865. 1865, which all Christians in the Arabic speaking world are, are using inside the Arab world, outside it, we are using in church services. Um, and the people behind the translation are a group of six, a group of five, yes, including two missionaries, Eli Smith and Cornelius Van Dyke, um, and three native speakers of Arabic. Two of them are well known Arab gram grammarians and intellectuals, Nasif al Yazji and Bokros al Mustani, and one of them is an Imam in Al Azhar Mosque. And we know from the history that the job of this man, that's the picture to the far left, uh, Sheikh Yusuf al Asir, the job of this man was to look at the grammar of the translation and to make sure that the voweling and the grammar is all right. Um, this translation itself was published from 1865 until now in multiple editions. And with each edition, we have a different set of paratextual features. And when you examine every single edition, you can make some well-informed guesses about who the audiences are um, and what specific, uh, what, what specific areas in the translation the publishers want to um, draw the attention of the readers to. Just to show you one example, this is an edition that was published back in 1877. I used 
to have this version like 10 years ago, but it, it, it is no longer published now by the, um, the Egyptian society, the Egyptian Bible Society, uh, as far as I know. Uh, but when it was done in 1877, as you can see, this is Matthew chapter one. And as you can see from the uh, title page, uh, what you are told in the subtitles, that's a translation with full annotations and introductions for every single book. So it's fully annotated. It's like a study Bible um, with a lot of uh, footnotes, which are very, very schol scholarly notes about uh, the oldest manuscripts, uh, things which are not, uh, which, uh, which cannot be seen in the oldest manuscripts and this kind of stuff. Um, this edition was published back in 1877. Nowadays, it's no longer there, uh, which again raises questions about the changes of audiences and the changes of situations. I think I've gone beyond my time though, and I'll stop here. Shall I stop sharing? Well, I certainly don't wanna cut you off while the flow is gone. Fascinating. Thank you so much. At this point, we're going to transition now into a question and answer time. And um, I'm going to go ahead and promote somebody in the audience here to panelists, somebody who needs no promotion. But um, that is Dick Croneman, um, International Coordinator for Translation for, um, for SIL. Um, and Dick had a, a very important or a very um, interesting question or a very interesting topic that he wanted to raise. And um, Dick, you wrote to me in an email saying that you wanted to explore a little bit about how paratext can be used to address controversial theological topics or issues. Uh, yes, that's right. Um, and of course, I mean, when I was asking my question, I had not heard a presentation yet. Uh, I mean, this was a, a, a very interesting presentation. Uh, uh, I mean, very well done. And um, uh, yeah, so um, 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 the main focus of, uh, of your presentation was on the sociological aspects of paratext. And then, uh, so as I was wondering about the theological aspects. Uh, uh, for example, in your presentation, uh, you gave the example of an Arabic Bible where, um, uh, I mean, the paratext had, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit at first, and then later on it had, um, okay, in the name of God, the most compassionate and the, uh, most merciful. So, um, uh, my uh, my question is, in uh, in addition to the uh, I mean the visual framing and um, the framing, um, the framing, uh, the framing of the sounds. Is there also like um, uh, more, more or less, uh, more, uh, more or less th uh, uh, theological framing um, that may or may not be um, uh, implicit in the paratext? And my question uh, to you is. Um, um, maybe you could um, 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 elaborate a little bit on um, the theological aspects of the paratext in the history of um, um, of Arabic Bible translations. Fascinating question. Thank you so much, Dick. Um, yes, of course. Um, <clears throat> the example I mentioned quite quickly, the example of Saadia Gawun, who is a Jewish rabbi and philosopher, as, as I've just mentioned, and a translator as well. I mean, when you look at all of his translations, um, you can see the theological framing of the whole act of translation there. At a very subtle and sophisticated level, this man was, he was known for, for, for having conversations and dialogues with um, Islamic theologians. And he himself was known for um, even establishing and founding what was known later as the Jewish Kalam school. And Kalam is the word for Islamic theology. So he tried to engage with um, his fellow Arabs uh, who were with him at the time. Uh, in his exegetical translations, you can see some uh, the small prefaces at the very beginning, but even in the body of the translation itself, 
the way he chose his own words, the way he unpacked one verse and paraphrased it uh, to make it accessible. Uh, and sometimes the paratexts are not at the margin of the text, but they are inside the body of the text in the form of uh, expanding on translations, paraphrasing them, adding things here and there uh, to respond to questions which might be raised in the mind of the readers. So yes, there have been some theological framing. Saad Yagaoun is just one example. There are many other examples. Um, there is a whole series of publications which was published in Lebanon starting from the 1980s called Arab Christian Heritage. The whole purpose behind this series of publication is to republish uh, most of these works. Some of them are translations, some of them are, um, are epitexts, if you like, reviews and commentaries and explanatory notes on, on already existing Arabic translations that tries to make them accessible and understandable by non-Christians. Does that answer your question, Dick? You're muted, I think. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, still the question, um, uh, I mean, for uh, for example, I mean, if, uh, if there is a shift from, okay, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to uh, in the name of God, the most merciful, uh, uh, I mean, what is the implication? Uh, I mean, is the implication maybe, uh, are we just, uh, I mean, using a more, uh, I mean, domesticating way of expressing yourself in the language and the culture, or is the um, uh, or is the implication maybe a weakening of, um, uh, I mean, the belief in the doctrine of the Trinity, um, and I mean, how do you know that? Well, that's a very difficult methodological question. I mean, this is the dilemma of all social historians of the Arabic Bible because of the fact that um, the extra textual information, if you like, of these manuscripts are minimal. Sometimes we don't even have the names of the translators. Uh, sometimes we are lucky to have them at the very end in the colophon, but in most cases, we don't even have uh, the names of the translators. So was, was something like that, the use of the Christian Basmala or the Islamic Basmala, all we can do is just to speculate what you have just shared might be quite possible, trying to engage um, those from a different belief system uh, and to make them understand the, 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 the doctrine of, of Trinity, um, or maybe trying to highlight the sacredness of the Christian scriptures. The, message, the implicit message here is that this is not less sacred than the Quran. And that's why I'm opening this text with that expression, the Islamic Basmala, this is a sacred text. So as we have said about the paratext, trying to invite the reader in, not turn them away. That's a sacred text. So all of these are speculations. And that's all we can do. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yes, that answered my question. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, excellent. Yes, we have time for more questions. Um, we have, um, do you see the question submitted via the question and answer feature here, Samet? The one, uh, the sociological press perspective? Yep, yep. Um, Tom the McCormick. Apparently, is there any, is there any implication of such matters being prescriptive for biblical uh, Bible translation. Yes, it is, it is within uh, the descriptive approach to translation. The implications of that for becoming prescriptive, I would say is, is minimal because, because the rationale behind sociology of translation is, the methodological rationale is stepping back, staying away from the translation case and describe it as it is. Of course, this is not to say that the sociologist is totally objective. On the contrary, as I've said, the biases of the person who describes and explains are still there. And that's why Bourdieu talks about something very, very interesting here, the notion of self-reflexivity. When I'm describing that case, when I'm trying to understand it, I am fully aware that I'm biased. And, um, and I'm fully aware that 
the final picture of the description has some touches and hints from my own my own um, orientations, my own my own mindset. Um, so it, it it shouldn't be prescriptive. Um, but if you mean by prescriptive, does it help us to understand translation differently? Does it help us to do translation differently? If, if that is what you mean by prescriptive, I would say yes, it can help us. It can direct us to specific ways of reading translations and doing them, uh, if that makes sense. Okay. And do you see that? Okay, so we have one other question here. Did you see the question here about um, um, an Arab born Nigerian who claims to have translated the Bible into Arabic six months after his conversion? Are you familiar with this? Um, this was submitted to us by David Okin. Are you familiar with this um, story here? No, no. I would love to know more about that if you can <laughs> share more information. Yeah, we'll have to um, we'll have to Google that name to see what's going on. That sounds fascinating. Yes. Okay. Well, we do have a little bit more time for um, for question and answer. If um, anyone else is itching to ask a question here, um, there was a question related to um, domestication and foreignization. Um, did we hear you rightly that you're claiming that those concepts stem from Schleiermacher's work? More, more or less, they are reworkings of the same of the same notion. It was because of this of this dichotomy, this binarism that Schleiermacher set back in the 19th century that we still talk about: author versus reader, overt versus covert, domestication versus foreignization. Um, I'm not judging this terminology as uh, as incompetent. They are useful, but maybe what we need, uh, not only in connection with this terminology, but with any other terminology used in the field, we use we need to be critical. We need to make sure that these terms do not capture reality. They are not reality. They help us to understand reality, but reality is much more complicated than the terminology and the theories and the approaches we we, we talk about. Mm. Okay, excellent. Um, we have a question here submitted to us from Peter Schmidt. Is there any chance to hear um, some about efforts today to accommodate various Arabic speaking audiences with different paratexts? Yes, there are, there are, there are some, some few initiatives. I don't want to mention names here, <laughs> but there are some few initiatives in which paratext has been fundamental. Uh, because, as I've said, um, uh, for many different reasons, um, some of them has to do with uh, the Quranic text itself. Uh, the image of the Christian belief system has misrepresented, and it's all about using the paratext to try to clear the air about, about what is the gospel, who is Jesus, what is Christianity all about. Some, so sometimes it's all about your cover. It's all about your preface. It's about these little footnotes that you can provide with the translation to engage proactively um, with, these, with these criticisms or misrepresentation of Jesus and, and his work and the whole of Christianity. Uh, but having said that, um, some paratextual elements can help invite readers and some others can cause controversy as Nick has mentioned uh, uh, shortly. So unless the producers of the translation are quite cautious, because that's a very sensitive context. That's a context with its own specific features and requirements, um, unless you are quite clear about what kind of response and implication you want to achieve by this paratext, it might not be helpful. So you need to be, the, the choice of the paratext need to be very well calculated. Otherwise, implications might be counterproductive. Yes, uh, but I think important for us is to see the way that paratext can be harnessed to, to complement um, the biblical text in various ways to invite the reader in. I find that those very helpful notions. I would love to ask my friend Andy what he thinks about all this. 
Uh, thank you, Drew, and hello, everybody. Um, I felt that the uh, image of the threshold it was really great too, and I, it's a, a very welcoming image, very appropriate. Of course, we have those kind of thresholds in all of our Bible products, and we care about our Western audiences, that uh, Bible products should be welcoming and inviting to them. Uh, we ask lots of questions uh, in our various organizations about how far we can go. Um, are we comfortable with uh, customized Bibles with the uh, picture of a church leader on the front cover of the uh, Bible and one of our Bible texts on the inside um, with their own uh, Bible study notes, which might be very tendentious. Um, uh, quite often they might be uh, promoting a particular theology like prosperity theology that uh, we wouldn't feel was um, mainly um so we ask those kind of people outside of um the churches is a very appropriate right thing to do and we would so i think that's a, a really very nice way to characterize i think i think you i suspect you said something profound andy but um your audio kind of cut out either that it, or it was my um, internet. I, I uh, I'm still here. Okay, excellent. Yes, the threshold, the best of you. Yep, yep, we've got to. Yep, a little bit better. Yep. Good, excellent. Um, I, I would like to. So know I think a that's, what, bit. that's what I would say. If we. Ahead, I think Andy. it's very helpful for us to focus on those positive metaphors for paratext and uh, the work that we do in framing Bible products and uh, productization, if I can use that term, um, that was used in a paper uh, not too long ago. Um, we, to, to frame that in a, in a more positive way rather than the rather negative discourse that has been associated with some of this uh, framing of Bible products. Um, we really are trying to keep the door open to people and welcome them into a text that we consider very precious. Hmm. Yes, that's a good word. Yes. Okay, good. Um, I would, I would just kind of in closing here, we do have um, just waiting for some other questions to come in if people still have them. Um, just talk to us briefly about your love for, for Shakespeare, Samek. Um, why Shakespeare of all comparanda? Oh, yeah. Do you have time for, for answer this question? Why Probably. Shakespeare? Yes. <laughs> there are some personal reasons and there are some professional reasons. Pro personal reasons have, have to do with the ability of Shakespeare to dissect us, to dissect the human psyche from inside. Uh, mm. And this is mainly done through his monologues, the soliloquies, like to be or not to be, all of the soliloquies of Othello. You can see the human nature in, in, in tension with the outside world and in tension with itself. He is at his best when he does mm -hmm. that in the monologue. So I, I, personally, I love that. Mm -hmm. Professional reasons, because I was interested in sociology of translation and to use this kind of approach, you need, you need a big context, you need a big field. You need a number of, a large number of translators, a large number of institutions with interest in translating Shakespeare into Arabic. Um, otherwise, if, 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 if you study someone um, whose work has been translated just once into Arabic, this doesn't give you a bigger backdrop against which you can map that field and talk about this network of relationships between translators, uh, designers, in, this, in, uh, in the case of um, theater, we're also talking about theater directors and actors and actresses. All of these are contributors uh, to the process of translating Shakespeare into Arabic. So there are personal reasons mm -hmm. as well as professional reasons. Excellent, excellent, good. Well, thank you so much. Um, waiting to see if we have more questions um come in 
it's true we wanted to take a historic approach because the rich, the, the history of the transmission of the Bible in Arabic throughout the centuries has been absolutely fascinating. I remember the first time that I read that, um, was it the rabbi, the 10th century rabbi that you mentioned, Samik, who his Arabic translation was actually presented in Hebrew characters rather than Arabic script. I, I find that so fascinating. And um, do you want to just speak to that a little bit? I mean, you alluded to it a bit in your presentation, but not writing Arabic in an Arabic script, but writing Arabic in Hebrew characters. Interesting choice. Uh, this is this is not my special uh, my specialty, but uh, all I can say is that Saadia Gaun, who lived in the ninth and the tenth centuries, uh, he was the founder, the father of what we call Judeo Arabic literature, um, writing Hebrew, um, writing Arabic and Hebrew scripts. And what is what is surprising for me now is that there is there is a lot of interest in Hebrew studies departments in the Arab world. In, especially in Egypt, uh, in getting the work of this man transliterated back into Arabic letter. Hmm. So hmm. in my last visit to Egypt, I, I've, I've obtained um, copies of his translation of the Pentateuch, translation of the book of Job in Arabic letters. So there is some interest now in his work. Uh, but you're right, he was the founder of Judeo-Arabic literature. After him, we had a number of scholars who are interested um, in that, um, and as I said, we do teams of researchers with interest in this area because there is still a lot to be done. Uh, that's a large ground that still ways to be mapped. Mm -hmm. Yes, excellent. Well, could you tell us a little bit now, Samik, what are some areas of research interest that you are pursuing at the moment? Right, yes. So now after my book on Shakespeare from a sociological perspective, um, um, I have been working for the last few years on individual articles on the Arabic Bible. And the intention now is to try to write a book, a whole monograph about the social history of the Arabic Bible. Still using um, um, sociology of Bourdieu uh, and trying to, to create a narrative that makes us understand cases like what I have mentioned, narratives about not only the producers of these translations, but the constituencies of freedoms, the congregations, um, the people coming from different belief systems, having access to these translations, how did it all work? And methodologically, it is quite challenging for many, many reasons. One of them has to do with looking at all of these manuscripts, which are scattered across the globe, at the globe in different museums, different archives, um, but that's what I'm working on at the moment. And paratextuality is an integral part of that. This is one of my other tools through which I can read these translations as a social document. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, yes, I believe somebody sent in a question for Andy to ask you, Samek, in kind of a, yes. So Andy, why don't you go ahead and ask this next question? Andy, are you still with us? Andy? Maybe Andy's not with us. Okay. Well, if Andy pops back on in the next couple of moments, then we'll um, let him ask this. This fun Oh, are you back, Andy? I think we have one final question that you were going to ask on behalf of someone. Uh, yes, I was referring to the uh, very good question that's in the chat as to whether there are any examples of foreignizing paratext. That is whether uh, paratext can be used yes. for deliberate foreignizing. Yes. Um, there are examples. One example that comes to mind is, is the interlinear Hebrew and New Testament Bible in Arabic. When you look at the, the covers, when you look at the formatting, um, this is very much for, for an I mean, the impression that is created in the minds of the readers and whoever looks at the politics or framing of this, um, of this publication is that it is, it is very much distant, it's, it's remote, it's far, it's very close to the source text. Um, there are many other editions where you have um, 
English used side by side with Arabic. And that's a little bit foreignizing. Uh, I don't know what's, what's the function of these kind of editions where you have English and Arabic side by side, probably for um, bilingual speakers, people are trying to learn Arabic and things like that, but it does feel fully nice when you look at it. These are the two examples that come to mind. One might uh, add perhaps um, one thing. Um, I've been in discussion recently with um, Jos Teche about the TIPS website, and he's interested in foreignizing Bible translations, such as the Bubo Rosenzeig transla translation in German and the uh, Shuraki translation in French. And one of the very interesting things in the Shuraki translation is the little um, image that is used to represent the name of God. Um, which is a deliberately foreignizing one, um, deliberately uh, with elements that are deliberately non-readable um, uh, out of uh, a, the kind of sense of honor for, for God's name. Um, that, that's a, a paratextual kind of element, is a graphic element um, mm -hmm. built into the text. I, I find that very helpful. Um, yeah. And there is also a, a new initiative for a, um, a specially typeset Bible in the German speaking world, I'm very sorry, I've forgotten the name of the product I'm referring to, um, which similarly foreignizes through very um, creative graphic design and typesetting. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones I would think of. Yeah. Fascinating, yes. Okay, well, that is our time for today. Samek, thank you so much for giving us this guided tour of paratextuality and introducing us to some concepts and uh, the intersection of paratextuality and the Arabic Bible. You've certainly lit a fire that will keep burning for generations, so thank you. Um, I would encourage everyone to continue um, with the show notes to find uh, references, to continue reading, learning more about this as we seek to apply all of these insights to, the, uh, to, to Bible translation. Um, we're gonna close now. Um, by offering a word of blessing, uh, a prayer, if it's all right with you, Samek. Um, I'll have my colleague, Harry, uh, pray over you. Just ask the Lord to bless your work and um, your research. Thank you. Okay, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the life of Dr. Hanna, for the research he's done, for how he wants to glorify you by studying your word and look at how various things with the text and outside the text can be used to promote you and the content of the text. Thank you for his research. Um, give him long, positive research and years to study. Um, pray that we will really be thinking about some of the things that he shared, that he shared with us about the paratext in the Bible and how we can also use that to increase people's desire to want to study and internalize your word and use all of our senses to know about you. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Thank you so you much. Her. Well, that it concludes our October webinar for BT List Live. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Hanna. Excellent presentation. Enjoyed having you. Um, on November 17th, we will be back um, with Lenart Direct to look at, to have a guided tour of the linguistic coherence in the biblical text of the Balaam narrative in Numbers 22 through 24. So that we're gonna touch on discourse analysis and linguistic coherence in that text. You will not wanna miss that. I'm just about to send out all the information. Well, blessings to you, brother. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, if you have any questions or like to follow up on anything you hear, heard here today, feel free to message me. Um, but until next time, take care and blessings. Godspeed. Thank you so much, Drew. Thanks, Harry.